Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Brexit crisis talks at number 10 began this morning and cabinet ministers are still in Downing Street as we come on air. The marathon session is just one indication of the challenges facing Theresa May as she tries to find a way through the opposing and contradictory views of her own cabinet, her own party and parliament as a whole. While the cabinet was locked in discussions, a cross-party group of MPs was already trying to regain control of the legislative process, this time to prevent UK leaving the EU without a deal in 10 days. We expect the Prime Minister to make a statement shortly. We'll bring you that statement the moment it happens. But first, our Deputy Political Editor, John Pienaar, is in Westminster for us. John. George, no one's managed to come up with a Brexit deal capable of commanding the support of Parliament. The Prime Minister has tried twice and failed. MPs have taken control and also failed twice. Now, MPs will be making another attempt later this week. So, Mrs May's dilemma, how to have one last throw of the dice before going to Brussels next week, where EU leaders will decide whether to give Brexit more time or whether the outcome that many fear most could be what happens, a no-deal Brexit. Is it time to go for no-deal, Foreign Secretary? Who knows what will become of Brexit? Apart from the cabinets, obviously, they don't have a clue. Today, they discussed leaving with no deal, something some ministers fear as a potential disaster. Six hours they talked seemed like longer. Inside, they even considered what might happen in a snap election. Scary, apparently, but Brexit has been blocked and blocked again, and ministers can't agree how to make leaving a reality. The message to MPs we'd heard already, back Mrs May's deal and quickly. I believe the UK will be so much better once we've left the European Union and I'm supporting the Prime Minister to make sure that we do that. In Brussels, the EU's chief negotiator had a clear cold warning to go with breakfast. Be ready for no deal or a long delay to Brexit if Parliament won't back the Brexit plan he thrashed out with the UK. Only two options would remain, leaving without an agreement or requesting a longer extension of the Article 50 period. It would be the responsibility, it would be the responsibility of the UK government to choose. At Westminster, after twice failing to agree their own Brexit plan, they're wiping the slate clean for another go. Now, some MPs want to lock Mrs May by law into delaying Brexit till Parliament can agree. I think we're in a very dangerous situation now because there's only 10 days until April the 12th when we're currently in risk of crashing out with no deal. So the Prime Minister does need to come forward with a proposal to extend beyond April the 12th because we're going to need that whatever is agreed or not in the next couple of days. This bill simply requires her to do that. I can no longer sit for this party. Oh, no. The MP who turned independent Conservative last night has hit out hard at former colleagues. Opposition MPs enjoyed him breaking ranks. Today, he accused Tory MPs of running scared of Brexiteer retribution. When you have a combination of cowardice and dogma in a political party that is meant to be the government of the country at a moment of national crisis, then it's not pretty. Time and again, the Prime Minister has put off the moment of decision. MPs will get another chance, perhaps to see that Brexit is delayed, perhaps to call for a softer Brexit than the plan on offer from Mrs May. Either way, this drama will go on through the week and on to next week, where there'll be another EU summit, and Britain's next stage on its Brexit journey will be mapped out. In Downing Street, they're taking this crucial stage one step at a time. With ministers and MPs so split, does anyone have a choice? Brexit, Mrs May's premiership are on the line now. Stability, not an option. John Pienaar, BBC News. Well, we're expecting that statement from the Prime Minister any minute now. We'll, that's uh, number 10 you're looking at now. We'll bring you that statement just as soon as it happens. In the meantime, let's uh, go back to, to John. John, she's... Let's, let's hear now. Let's hear from the Prime Minister. I've just come from chairing seven hours of Cabinet meetings, focused on finding a route out of the current impasse, one that will deliver the Brexit the British people voted for and allow us to move on and begin bringing our divided country back together. I know there are some who are so fed up with delay and endless arguments 
that they would like to leave with no deal next week. I've always been clear that we could make a success of no deal in the long term, but leaving with a deal is the best solution. So we will need a further extension of Article 50, one that is as short as possible and which ends when we pass a deal. And we need to be clear what such an extension is for, to ensure we leave in a timely and orderly way. This debate, this division, cannot drag on much longer. It is putting members of Parliament and everyone else under immense pressure and it is doing damage to our politics. Despite the best efforts of MPs, the process that the House of Commons has tried to lead has not come up with an answer. So today I am taking action to break the logjam. I am offering to sit down with the Leader of the Opposition and to try to agree a plan that we would both stick to, to ensure that we leave the European Union and that we do so with a deal. Any plan would have to agree the current withdrawal agreement. It has already been negotiated with the 27 other members and the EU has repeatedly said that it cannot and will not be reopened. What we need to focus on is our future relationship with the EU. The ideal outcome of this process would be to agree an approach on a future relationship that delivers on the result of the referendum, that both the Leader of the Opposition and I could put to the House for approval and which I could then take to next week's European Council. However, if we cannot agree on a single unified approach, then we would instead agree a number of options for the future relationship that we could put to the House in a series of votes to determine which course to pursue. Crucially, the Government stands ready to abide by the decision of the House. But to make this process work, the Opposition would need to agree to this too. The Government would then bring forward the Withdrawal Agreement Bill. We would want to agree a timetable for this Bill to ensure it is passed before the 22nd of May, so that the United Kingdom need not take part in European parliamentary elections. This is a difficult time for everyone. Passions are running high on all sides of the argument. But we can and must find the compromises that will deliver what the British people voted for. This is a decisive moment in the story of these islands, and it requires national unity to deliver the national interest. Well, there was that uh, statement from the Prime Minister. She said, making it after what she said was seven hours of, of uh, cabinet discussions today. There was a lot there in those few minutes of a statement. Uh, let's just talk it all through with, uh, with John Peanut. John, um, she says she's offering to sit down with Jeremy Corbyn. That's so. George, the Prime Minister, has run out of time. She's run out of options. And she's now set herself on a course involving a succession of very high-stakes gambles. First, to sit down with Jeremy Corbyn and try to find some common approach to Brexit that could then be put to Parliament. The chances of that would have to be described at this point as bleak. The leaders are so far apart. Failing that, if it does fail, they go on then to a series of votes in Parliament with the government, this time for the first time, promising to go with the outcome and take that idea for Brexit to Brussels. Then we go into the business of European leaders, whether to say, yep, that will be enough. You can have your extension for an indeterminate time until we can sort this thing called Brexit out. It doesn't end there. While that is going on, while the time that's bought is maybe provided to the government, provided to Parliament, you could also expect a good deal of trouble among Conservatives, with some of the tougher line Tories on Brexit getting together almost certainly to look for a possible way to remove me, uh, the Prime Minister, if they can, and carry on with Brexit under a leader more to their liking. These are, George, certainly defining times. John, just talk me through, through the timing. As I understood it, these talks with Jeremy Corbyn, they've got to happen before this EU Council meeting next week. 
Well, the, the course the Prime Minister set out involves going to the European Council and asking them for an extension. She set that out. She set that out in a way we have not heard before, did not put a time frame on that. It would be extended until a solution could be found. And now, presumably immediately, the process that she's just described begins. She would sit down with Jeremy Corbyn, try to find some approach to Brexit that both of them could live with. Certainly, the leader of the opposition would look for a rather softer Brexit, one closer to the European Union than anything Mrs May has been prepared to contemplate. That may or may not succeed. You wouldn't bet on it. And then you go to the next round of indicative votes. But those, this time with a great deal more force to them, because they would bind the government to a new Brexit policy. And that would be the policy that Mrs May would take to Brussels. Now, that policy, it's scarcely likely it would command universal support in the Tory party. So difficulties overseas at the European Council with European leaders and all sorts of trouble potentially being stored up back at Westminster in her own party and more widely. John, uh, certainly for the moment, thank you very much. Uh, our Europe editor, Katja Adler, is in Brussels. Katja, this morning we were hearing uh, uh, Michel Barnier talking about no deal becoming more and more likely. Um, what do you think this statement will make to their judgment now? I think EU leaders will pounce on the words national unity. They'll pounce on the words common approach. This is what EU leaders have been calling for all along. They're saying, look, when it comes to something as fundamental uh, about the UK's future as Brexit, then surely all political parties should find a way to bury their differences and work together. So they will hope that the Prime Minister can do that because however hardline EU leaders are trying to sound at the moment, no deal is the most likely outcome, they still would prefer by far to avoid a no deal scenario. Now, they will be concerned. They heard the Prime Minister say that she wants to be able to reach some kind of conclusion by the 22nd of May so the UK can avoid having to take part in European parliamentary elections, which start the day after. Now, that will make EU leaders worried. They will want to believe her. They'll want to believe this can be done and dusted and they can move on together to a new UK future or whatever the UK decides uh, by the end of May, but they won't believe it considering the divisions in Parliament that they still saw in glaring vision last night. And if they don't believe her, they may say that she may have to sign up to a potentially longer extension and take part in those elections because what they worry about, George, is if the UK doesn't take part in those elections and then ask for another extension, the whole new European Parliament that will already be voted will not be legally valid if the UK is still a member Member state any time into that new period that the European Parliament sits. So it continues to be complicated. It continues to be fraught with difficulty on both sides. But EU leaders are crossing their fingers that there will be some way through now. All right, Katya, thank you very much. Theresa May has offered to sit down with Jeremy Corbyn to break the logjam over Brexit and agree a joint plan for Britain's departure. If those talks are successful, she said, she'll ask the EU for another extension but only up until the 22nd of May. She revealed her plan less than an hour ago after an extraordinary all-day cabinet meeting which started at 9.30 this morning in political mode with no civil servants in the room. The formal meeting stretched right the way into this evening. At the same time, down the road in Parliament, MPs were trying to think up new ways to take control and force the government to negotiate a softer Brexit deal. Our political editor, Gary Gibbon, is with me now. Gary. Well, as you said, there were two meetings there, a political cabinet which looked quite a bit of the general election, I think in order uh, to destabilise and unnerve some cabinet ministers, so just maybe they would swallow what was coming up in the next session. Because what Theresa May seems to be doing here is asking for a longer extension which she hopes not to use. I say seems because only Theresa May could do a statement to the nation that no one can quite work out. And I think the language here is opaque, reflecting the agony of that cabinet. Because what she's, I think, got past cabinet is what might be called a flex extension. She knows that the EU isn't up for just another little mini extension. And so she's asking, can we have an opt-out early? Should I get lucky with my dealings with the opposition or trying to get stuff past Parliament? Look at the language uh, used here. She asks for a further extension as short as possible, which ends when we pass a deal. 
that does run a kind of coach and horses through the deal that she's already got on an extension. She is asking for more, absolutely no guarantee that the EU will lap this up. And then the other part of all of this is where she's saying she wants to sit down with the leader of the opposition. What are we? April the 2nd? I think Brexit Day was the 29th of March. She wants to sit down with him and agree a plan on how to move things forward. And if they can't agree a plan, quite plausible that, I think, uh, she says that they will agree on some ideas that would go in front of uh, uh, MPs to have indicative votes. Now, they have been doing indicative votes, as you will have noticed, but she's now saying that she's going to back uh, a form of indicative votes and will abide by the outcome. And we know that any outcome, if there is an outcome, if there is a majority for anything, almost certainly means a softer Brexit. Just a word on the idea of talks with Jeremy Corbyn. She knows extremely well that this uh, will be something that he probably feels he has to turn up to but really won't want to get too heavily involved in. If I've heard one phrase from shadow cabinet members more than any other when it comes to uh, Brexit, it is the Tories must own this, uh, followed by uh, a word like mess quite often, or sometimes uh, something a little bit more unpleasant. She also knows that Jeremy Corbyn has people on his back trying to get him uh, to go for a referendum, and so this will discomfort him. How genuine is she about the chances of seeking uh, cooperation with him? Well, we'll see, but as I say, it is April the 2nd, 2019. Here's how the day went here, much of it spent waiting, waiting for that cabinet to end. Shortly after breakfast, they disappeared into number 10 for a cabinet meeting to crunch the government's options. At times, it seemed they might never be seen again. It would be more than seven hours before they emerged. While they were locked in, the EU's chief negotiator ratcheted up the pressure, saying there would be hefty conditions attached to any long extension to the Brexit delay that Britain might ask for. A strong justification, a strong justification would be needed. Many businesses in the EU warn us against the cost of extending uncertainty. There would also be a political cost. In any case, if the UK is still a member state on the 23rd of May, it will have to organise the European elections. The Irish Prime Minister visiting President Macron in Paris struck different tones. Mr Varadkar desperately wants to avoid a no-deal Brexit. France's president doesn't sound so sure. If the United Kingdom is not capable almost three years after the referendum of coming forward with a solution that is supported by a majority, it will have effectively chosen a no-deal exit on its own, and we cannot avoid that failure for them. While the cabinet meeting dragged on and the stage was set for a prime ministerial statement, MPs of all parties tried to steer Theresa May away from an election or towards another referendum. Still, she is too scared to take on one faction or another faction in her own cabinet. And if she is not willing to take on her own cabinet in the interests of what is good for our country, then I am deeply worried about where we're going. Some people in Downing Street who think a general election uh, might be the button to press. What do Tory MPs say about that privately? Uh, well, I'll tell you, they think they're mad. And the reason why they're mad is because it would be a deeply destabilising thing to do, not just for the party, but for the country. Everybody watching this will know that the Conservative Party over the last two years have been trying to achieve a major piece of policy. If we fail to do that and then go to the country, the country's not going to be, you know, full of love. Then, just under an hour ago, the Prime Minister gave this statement. I have just come from chairing seven hours of Cabinet meetings, focused on finding a route out of the current impasse. So we will need a further extension of Article 50, one that is as short as possible and which ends when we pass a deal. Today I am taking action to break the logjam. I'm offering to sit down with the Leader of the Opposition and to try to agree a plan that we would both stick to to ensure that we leave the European Union and that we do so with a deal. However, if we cannot agree on a single unified approach, then we would instead agree a number of options for the future relationship that we could put to the House in a series of votes to determine which course to pursue. Crucially, the government stands ready to abide by the decision of the House. But to make this process work, the opposition would need to agree to this too. 
This is a decisive moment in the story of these islands, and it requires national unity to deliver the national interest. Having played her part in frustrating the last two attempts by MPs to ballot on alternatives to her Brexit plan, the Prime Minister now saying she will implement MPs' wishes if there's no Labour-Tory agreement. Last night's second print run of green ballot papers failed to produce an outright winner. In frustration, one of the main organisers said he'd had enough of the Conservative Party. My party refuses to compromise. I regret, therefore, to announce that I can no longer sit for this party. Oh, Nick. Nick, don't go. Come on. Honourable gentleman, he's told the House. There were angry exchanges, too, in Labour and the Lib Dems aimed at colleagues some thought had refused to compromise and back rival approaches. And the MP with the most senior medical career in Parliament says she is approached more and more by MPs feeling sick with stress and strain. Some people talk about already even struggling to find the right words, their brains are moving slower. You know, exhaustion results, as we know, in poor decision-making. Sleep deprivation results in poor decision-making. So I think, really, this is not a healthy place at the moment. It's a and sick I'm, house. It, it really is. Theresa May's statement only adds to the stressful times ahead. Their seven hours of talks has produced a plan the EU may find difficult to swallow and which gives no certainty when so many crave it. With me now is the Government Minister Tobias Elwood. He's a, minister, a Defence Minister. Uh, and uh, if, I would like to ask first of all, Tobias Elwood, I mean, this could have been done months and months ago. This had to be a bipartisan action. And yet she's blinded on on her own and got nowhere. You, you can't, I think, criticise any Prime Minister of the day trying to get their deal across the line. And we've tried many options there. It goes back to the original question as to what it means to leave. We all decided we wanted to leave the EU but didn't say where we wanted to go. And so many individuals across the country and indeed Parliament have got their own purest view as to what Brexit means. We've had to reconcile that. Everybody's had to compromise somewhat. And we've explored different options, as you know, looking at the backstop, working with the DUP, and it hasn't got us anywhere. The country is calling us to say, solve this, get on with this. Parliament needs to act, and so the Prime Minister has stepped forward to say, let's do this. Let's try and find a unified approach with the leader of the opposition. If we fail that, as you heard, we then go to indicative votes, which will then count. But ultimately, we want a managed Brexit. We want to avoid no deal. We also want to avoid uh, European Union elections. Well, two and a half years of failure. And with 10 days no, to go, okay. 10 days to go, she begs to get the leader of the opposition to talk to her and help her out. So it isn't two and a half years. It's worth explaining. You know this better than most. There's two parts to this departure. The first is the withdrawal agreement. That did take about two years to put together all the details on how we actually depart to make yeah, sure we have managed. Yeah, but they should have done that together. It's the second... Together. No, because the Labour has already agreed the withdrawal agreement. Keir Stammer has been on your programme to say, I haven't got a problem with the withdrawal agreement. It's the next phase. What is the future relationship? That's where the arguments come as to whether it should be involved a customs union or whether it should be whatever it might be. That's what Parliament's failed to actually agree, and that's what we do need to agree now. What the Prime Minister failed to understand was that this was never going to fit the paradigm of party politics, that her only option from the very outset was to look for the Europeans in the Parliament who were going to go the same direction that she wanted to take it. I recognise why you say that. The clock is still ticking. We're not there yet. We are looking at further options. The Prime Minister has been very clear today. Let's talk with uh, Jeremy Corbyn. Let's see where there goes. Let's then, if that doesn't work, then we go to the indicative approach. The important thing, though, is that there is a will on this side uh, of the channel to say, let's get this done in a managed way. And I understand the same is coming from Brussels as well. And that's good news. Whatever Mr Corbyn says, it all depends on Europe. Did, well, did, did she speak to them during this meeting? I'm afraid there's been a lot of political opportunism by Labour. I hope they will park that and do what is best for Britain. But we don't know what Europe's going to say to this. To what? To, well, the... to extending? What? They'll only do it if they really believe there's a deal in the offing. Absolutely. And we, not, we must prove that. We must work hard so we can actually gain that and make sure we get it across the line before we reach the 22nd of May. If we don't do that, 
The, the other option is that we have an extension, uh, and that takes us into European Union elections, so far away from what the referendum was saying. That is not in Britain's interest. Let's get on with this. Tobias Elwood, thank you very much indeed for talking with us. And Yvette Cooper now joins us for, now from the central lobby. Labour, of course, and she's there in the Houses of Parliament. Uh, Yvette Cooper, what do you make of this? Do you think Mr Corbyn's going to rise to this particular challenge? Well, I think the Prime Minister is right to recognise now that she can't implement anything by April the 12th and we cannot have crashing out with no deal on the 12th. It would be hugely damaging. We understand that the Cabinet Secretary, who is also the National Security Advisor to the Prime Minister and to the Cabinet, told the Cabinet that no deal would make us less safe. So I think it would have been irresponsible for the Cabinet or the Prime Minister to come to any other conclusion today. I think we should welcome what the Prime Minister has said about wanting to now listen to Parliament to work cross-party and to come forward with indicative votes. But, of course, I think we'll have a, a whole series of questions about how this is going to work, about how this has to be different from previous discussions which, which just didn't really go anywhere and didn't happen at all. Well, few Labour MPs have worked as hard as you have on, on this issue and you must know something of Mr Corbyn's mind. I mean, a great deal hangs upon what his approach to this is going to be. I think it also a great deal depends on what the Prime Minister's approach is going to be. So you're absolutely right. The, I think the um, uh, Labour and the Conservatives do need to come together and to have these debates and to have these proper conversations. But bear in mind that, I mean, I've been in to have discussions with ministers before, been invited in just as Jeremy and the Keir and the uh, front bench team have been. And actually, there hasn't been any sense that, that there was listening before. So I really hope that there will be now because I've always said actually everybody needs to come together to try and find a sensible way through this. As long as everybody is just shouting at each other, frankly, the whole country will be tearing their hair out whether they voted leave or voted remain. They just see a mess. So I hope this will be a sign of, of a different kind of approach. But I do, as I said, still have a series of questions for the Prime Minister about how this is going to work. But you've got your own track going here. You've got your own idea of what to do uh, and what to, how to take control in Parliament. Does that all lapse? Do you now sit on your hands and wait for these people to sort it out at the top? Well, I think that's why there are some important questions. So we had uh, put forward a, a bill that would really call on the Prime Minister to come forward with a, with a plan, with a proposal, to make sure that we didn't leave with no deal on April the 12th. So just to make sure we don't have the hit to medicine supplies, to our manufacturing and so on. I think the, the questions to the Prime Minister I would have would be about what is the process going to be to decide the length of the extension that she's going to put forward. We could do with knowing that. But also if the EU has a different response, they say something different in reply, how is she going to respond to that and what say will Parliament have on that as well? We also need to know how the indicative votes process is going to work. So we'll look really carefully right. at the proposals and I hope that this is really moving in the right direction now because in the end there's too much at stake not to. Uh, Yvette Cooper, in one word, do you anticipate Mr Corbyn bringing you into his circle to help out on this crisis? I think that's got to be for him. He's got to decide. I think Keir Starmer is doing an excellent job. And I've had many conversations with Keir, with Jeremy, uh, with many members of the Shadow Cabinet. But, you know, they have their responsibilities as the members of the Shadow Cabinet. Uh, we also, obviously, whether it's as chairs of select committees, right. as backbenchers working together, will continue to do so and to work with them as well. Yvette Cooper, thank you very much indeed for joining us. More from Westminster later. But for now, let's go over to Matt in the studio. Thanks, John. Well, a short time ago, the European Council President, Donald Tusk, gave his immediate response, tweeting, even if after today we don't know what the end result will be, let us be patient. Well, I'm joined now from Brussels by the Irish MEP, Mairead McGuinness, who's Vice President of the European Parliament. Uh, Mairead McGuinness, uh, it's wonderful to see you and that you've sorted out your Skype. Um, can you be patient? I mean, this offer today has come three days after Brexit was supposed to take place. 
Look, it's been a roller coaster day here in Brussels because much of the day was spent wor worrying and anticipating a no deal Brexit. And then we knew this uh, seven hour meeting was happening. And then this statement, and I have a copy here in my hand, but I need to dissect it. And I think the first thing to say is it, it is positive that the British Prime Minister is aware that a no deal Brexit is really bad for mm. the UK and for the European Union. I think her reaching across the House is, is, is welcome. Uh, and of course, we'll have to see what the reaction will be to that approach. And I hope it, it is positive. Uh, I think the timings I'm a little bit concerned about, but mm -hmm. I'm going to try and, and get over those concerns and look at the pragmatism now. I know in previous interviews, uh, which I've just listened to, others were saying, look, why did this take so long to happen? Uh, we can have that analysis. I'm just glad it's happening now. And I hope it yields a good result. Uh, because I think that there was real concern, uh, given last week's vote, that the House of Commons, that the United Kingdom could not find a way out of this mess. Right. And I, I hope that this speech will help chart a course towards uh, a resolution and a ratification of the withdrawal agreement. But there are also lots of known unknowns and lots of ifs. Um, do you think that, assuming that there is a meeting with Jeremy Corbyn and they come up with some sort of conclusion, that this will persuade the French especially to grant the longer extension that she will now seek at the summit next week? Well, I think the extension she's looking for is not that long, and that's what I'm concerned about, because at the moment it's April the 12th, so it's going beyond that. But as I understand it, the Prime Minister wants it to stop before the European election date. So in other words, that the ratification and all that goes with it will be dealt with before then. I mean, as I, as I speak and I think, because this is so, it's so new and it's happening literally as we talk, um, the European Parliament will have to ratify a withdrawal agreement. And I'm just thinking about the mm. timings of that. We will be in election mode, in fact, the last day of the campaign. Uh, so there's all sorts of timing, legal uh, complications, but I think the political dimension is the most significant mm. one. And if the political uh, classes in the United Kingdom can come forward, work together to resolve this crisis, then I think we might be able to resolve the other issues, right. the, the, the legal uh, and the technical issues. So I do think we need to see what next happens. Well, but indeed. it is a new development. OK, but we're about to hear from a, a leading member of the, you know, the, the Brexiteer side of the Tory party, and a lot of it hinges on them. If mm. there is a deal, do you think that Theresa May can actually be trusted to make it happen? Look, if there's a deal, there is one, let me be clear, the deal is on the table. I think the question is, if it is ratified, uh, it seems to me ratification will rebuild if trust is broken, as it is slightly at the moment. I think it would give us all that sense of purpose that we have uh, sorted the withdrawal part of this discussion mm. and we're looking to the future. But I do think that her conversations with Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the opposition, will have to deal with the political declaration. I presume he will look for something around uh, this um, customs, mm -hmm. whatever it is called, in his proposal. And also, perhaps, um, another referendum to clarify the situation. But again, that leaves us here in Europe a little bit concerned on timing right. and, and, I suppose, finalisation. But look, this is hot off the press. We have okay. to wait and see. And let's see what the reaction is tomorrow from the Labour Party leader. Indeed. Uh, Mairead McGuinness, thank you very much indeed. Well, Jacob Rees-Mogg has just described Theresa May's statement as an attempt to overturn Brexit in an attempt to do a deal with the socialists. It is very serious, he said, quote. The Conservative Brexiteer Anne-Marie Morris joins me now from the lobby of the House of Commons. Um, Anne-Marie Morris, it looks as if the ERG, you indeed, have been sacrificed by the Prime Minister on the altar of a softer Brexit. I don't think it's about the ERG sacrificed. I think it's the 17.2 million people who are being sacrificed because what now is on the table, frankly, is simply not Brexit. It's not delivering a leave result um, because what she's clearly looking at, I think I agree with Jacob, is a, a deal with uh, Labour which effectively will be a customs union. The reality is a customs union has always been the main starting point in her deal anyway, which is partly why I have always uh, mm. opposed it. But this does not deliver 
Brexit. Um, and it is something which, uh, frankly, is just unacceptable. This is not responsible behaviour of a Prime Minister. I expected her at this point, given that we are due to leave legally on the 12th of April, to recognise that there wasn't going to be a deal, a, a, a mutually agreed point, and that we'd be better off outside negotiating from a stronger right. position. But at every stage, you have miscalculated with your intransigent view about what kind of Brexit we should have, at every stage you've pushed her further into a corner and now she's basically turned round and snapped back at you and has decided to go with the other side. Oh, so I, I think I would uh, hold your fire on that. Uh, we have far from given up. And I think you'll find there are an awful lot of deeply frustrated Conservatives, whichever way they voted on that withdrawal agreement, that frankly will never vote for that withdrawal agreement again. So I would hold your conclusions and just wait to see what unrolls and unravels. There are all sorts of moving parts here. It's partly what goes on in Parliament, and remember, whatever has to get through both houses. Mm. It's partly about Europe and whether or not they will grant an extension. And I think she's a bit hopeful to think that Brussels will give her an extension until the 22nd to avoid European elections. I know they don't want European elections. But we've spent, what, over two years trying to get a deal? We're not going to do that by the 22nd. And if we leave it any later, then we are in uh, European election territory. Right. What you say sounds vaguely threatening, actually, to the Prime Minister, uh, not to me. But um, what are you going to do now? I mean, is the Tory party about to split? No. Are we about to see the split of the Tory party, the ERG, the hard Brexiteers, 200 of whom wrote a letter to the Prime Minister a few days ago saying they would like a no-deal Brexit if it came to that, yep. and the rest of the party. Is that what we're about to see? No, you're not going to see the party split. Think about it. The party is about a lot more than Brexit. And I think one of the challenges for all of us is we need to get this done. No deal, therefore, would have been the right answer. We need to move on to domestic issues. We have to deal with health, education, social but care... But no deal was never on the paper. ballot. No deal was never on the ballot. Uh, yeah, actually, it was. Uh, not on the last one, but on the one before. Uh, on, on the last one... On the referendum one, was... ballot. Oh, on the referendum. The referendum was simply um, uh, leave or remain. Uh, and in terms of it specifically saying no deal, mm. on the remain, it didn't say specifically the terms on which we would remain. Okay. Because remember, you know, Europe is fundamentally changing. Accepting remain isn't about accepting where we are now. All right, got to leave it there. Anne-Marie Morris, thank you very much indeed. For weeks now, the Prime Minister has tried to push her Brexit deal through Parliament and three times she has hit a brick wall. Parliament has failed twice to come up with an alternative. So finally, there was a change of tactic, a gamble for the risk-averse Mrs May and a compromise. In an effort to break the logjam, as she put it this evening in a statement inside Downing Street, she asked Labour and its leader Jeremy Corbyn for help in agreeing a plan that can get through the Commons. There are plenty of risks, of course, in that. The likely compromises on her so-called red lines and the likely extension to Brexit are already provoking hostility from the arch-Brexiters in her party and could split the Conservatives. No wonder the Cabinet meeting that took this decision lasted more than seven hours. This afternoon, there was a lot of hanging around in Downing Street. Turns out what was being agreed by the Cabinet inside could keep us all waiting a lot longer. The Prime Minister announcing she wants another delay to Brexit to avoid leaving without a deal by agreeing one with Labour. Today I am taking action to break the logjam. I'm offering to sit down with the Leader of the Opposition and to try to agree a plan that we would both stick to to ensure that we leave the European Union and that we do so with a deal. This is a decisive moment in the story of these islands and it requires national unity to deliver the national interest. So the plan is to hold talks with the Labour leader and agree a single approach to Brexit. That deal would be voted on by MPs before an EU summit next week. If the pair can't agree, then instead a series of options will be put to Parliament. All of this involves a delay, but the aim is still to leave before the European elections on May the 22nd. Tonight, the Labour leader was drawing up his demands, almost certainly a customs union and protection of workers' rights, though he too sounds open to negotiation. Are you saying that you are willing to compromise on your red lines if it means avoiding that crash out which you believe would be so detrimental? We will discuss with the Prime Minister. I don't want to set any limits one way or the other ahead of those meetings. I want you to understand the principles on which I will go into those meetings. 
recognising the needs of the people that have elected all MPs to Parliament and the need to avoid a dangerous crashing out. As for crashing out of the Cabinet... Are we headed for a soft Brexit, Home Secretary? After a seven-hour meeting today, nobody resigned over the plan, but there was a fierce debate. Do you think it's right to, to delay Brexit further, Welsh Secretary? Many Conservatives do not. The plan could split the Conservatives. I think it's very disappointing that the Brexit process has now been entrusted to Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party. And I think that the result will almost certainly be, if Corbyn gets his way, that we remain in the customs union so that uh, we can't control our trade policy, the huge areas of lawmaking uh, we can't control. And Brexit is becoming soft to the point of disintegration. One thing is softening tonight, the Prime Minister's resolve. The UK has been clear it is leaving the customs union. Could she really be willing to redraw the red lines she and others have stuck to all this time? Labour say tonight they want a customs union, that is the price of their cooperation. Is it a price that you are willing to pay? Well, I don't want to preempt the conversations that the Prime Minister will have with the leader of the opposition, but uh, everyone recognises that so far we haven't been able to secure a majority in the House of Commons. The one proposition that has actually secured the most votes, more than um, any idea of a customs union, is actually the Prime Minister's own withdrawal agreement. But you're not ruling out offering a customs union? Well, I think it's important that we uh, uh, do not preempt those conversations. With time limited, could the Prime Minister really buy herself some more by turning back the clock on everything she said before? Paul Brandt, News at 10, Westminster. Well, once again, the rest of the European Union has found itself trying to respond to another twist in the UK's Brexit crisis. Today, the European Parliament's Brexit coordinator, Guy Verhofstadt, said what he called Mrs May's cross-party compromise was better late than never. The main topic in European capitals has been about extending the deadline to leave, nowhere more so than Paris, where Ireland's Leo Varadkar had flown to talk Brexit with President Macron. Thanks for being here, dear Leo. They weren't expecting the late change of tack that came from London, but both good cop Varadka and bad cop Macron had earlier spelled out what a new extension would require from the UK. We'll need to uh, consider how we may respond uh, to uh, any request for a long extension, taking into account that 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 will involve the UK participating in the European elections and we want to avoid a rolling extension, so any extension must have uh, a clear purpose uh, and a clear plan. Une extension longue. A long-term extension, he said, implying involvement in the European elections is not automatic. I say that most forcefully. Je le répète ici avec beaucoup de force. They will, of course, be delighted that Mrs May appears to have softened some of her red lines, that she has, as they've long urged, reached across the aisle to include the opposition. But they're not about to allow London to pick its own extension rules. If you remember this photo from the European summit two weeks ago, where officials met in the corridors to design a schedule of extensions that would neither create a no-deal cliff edge nor jeopardise the European elections. And just this morning, at a speech in Brussels, Chief Negotiator Michel Barnier was once again laying down the only available options at this stage. If the UK Parliament does not vote in favour of the withdrawal agreement in the coming days, only two options would remain. Leaving without an agreement or requesting a longer extension of the Article 50 period. Council President Donald Tusk urged everyone not to rush to judgment on this latest development, tweeting this evening, even if after today we don't know what the end result will be, let us be patient. And from Guy Verhofstadt in the European Parliament, good that Theresa May is looking for a cross-party compromise. Better late than never. Neither here in Paris nor in other European capitals do they expect today's new approach to change the dynamics of next week's European summit. If Parliament is still debating by next Wednesday, they will expect Britain to prepare for those European elections. And if London still wants an extension, well, it and its duration will remain entirely in their gift.
James Mates News at 10, Paris. And Robert is here alongside me. There is so much to unpack from what we've seen today, Robert, but these red lines, are they now up for negotiation? Yes, they are. Uh, I mean, I obviously put to the Prime Minister's officials whether if the Labour Party were to suggest being in a customs union, uh, sort of got Jeremy Corbyn to support her deal, whether the Prime Minister would then whip for or against a customs union, which is completely contra contrary to their manifesto, a customs union. Um, there wasn't a reply, but that said, I then spoke to ministers and they said, look, it's absolutely clear she has decided there will not be on her watch a no-deal Brexit, if she can possibly avoid it, and that means she will negotiate a much softer Brexit, whether that is a negotiation with Jeremy Corbyn, if he can brought round to agreeing with somebody who has, frankly, demonised him for the past few years, um, uh, or if they can't do a deal, she will then go to Parliament and see what Parliament can do. So, if she is going to follow the will of Parliament, then, yes, her red lines are gone. It's an extraordinary shift, really, that we've witnessed today. Yeah. On, top that, yeah. on top of that, on top of that history in the making, we have a timetable which appears almost impossible. Well, I've said it's history in the making, but this is the sort of negotiation that ministers say to me should have happened months ago. Right? She has set herself a deadline of trying to agree a deal with Jeremy Corbyn. If that fails, trying to agree a deal with MPs, getting votes through the House, all by the end of this week, so that she can then write a letter to the EU President Donald Tusk saying this is what we would suggest to get us a delay uh, for Brexit to May the 22nd. But, nonetheless, there are... I don't know, something like 80 Tory MPs who hate what she's trying to do. There are many ministers who privately hate what she is trying to do. She will struggle to hold her party together in these circumstances. Northern Ireland's DUP have said to me privately, and they've issued a statement which more or less confirms this, that they hate what she is trying to do and they prop up her government. The risks for her are huge. One final thought, though. I think it is clear that she will now move heaven and earth to avoid a no-deal Brexit at the end of next week. I have been told why that is. She believes that if she were to go ahead with a new no deal, she would have to impose direct rule on Northern Ireland and that would lead to the breakup of the United Kingdom. She fears and she does not want that on her watch. OK, Robert, thank you very much for navigating all of that for us this evening. Thank you. We waited and speculated all day. Then, after a seven-hour marathon cabinet, the Prime Minister spoke to the nation. And it seems some things have definitely changed. To prevent no deal, she'll try to delay Brexit again. And she said the government stands ready to abide by the decision of the House, accepting that the Commons can define the shape of it. In the search for that new solution, she said, she would meet Jeremy Corbyn. That's caused apoplexy among many on the Tory benches. So Mrs May's famous red lines, some of them at least, are in play. That may mean remaining in a customs union, accepting greater protections for workers' rights and the environment, things we know Labour wants. One Conservative MP tonight told Newsnight that Corbyn is the new PM. And Boris Johnson claimed that Brexit is becoming soft to the point of disintegration. So was tonight, with a cliff edge just ten days away, the night that Theresa May finally made a choice, rounding on the party's right wing? I'll be speaking to Michael Gove and others about whether she can keep her cabinet, her party together, and what this latest position means for the shape of Brexit. But we start with our political editor, Nick Watt. Shattered but soldiering on. The story of the last two years as Theresa May sought to deliver Brexit on her side's terms. Now, with deadlock in her party, cabinet and parliament, the Prime Minister is reaching across the aisle. Despite the best efforts of MPs, the process that the House of Commons has tried to lead has not come up with an answer. So today I am taking action to break the logjam. I'm offering to sit down with the Leader of the Opposition 
and to try to agree a plan that we would both stick to to ensure that we leave the European Union and that we do so with a deal. There are limits to the offer, no change to the withdrawal agreement, but there is a three-point plan to try and reach agreement on the UK's future relationship with the EU. In stage one, she hopes to reach a deal with Jeremy Corbyn, which will be put to MPs before next week's EU summit. If that fails, the government will put a set of proposals to Parliament with the agreement of Labour. Number 10 would accept the verdict of MPs. If Parliament endorses an option, legislation would be passed before the 22nd of May to allow the UK to leave the EU before European parliamentary elections. Of course, I'm very happy to meet her. We need to have a discussion with the Prime Minister. We need to ensure that Parliament has an opportunity to vote on proposals that can prevent us crashing out of the EU in the, the end of next week. Theresa May is embarking on one last throw of the dice to avoid a no-deal Brexit. One member of the government described the seven-hour meeting as tough as ministers clashed over yet another extension to Article 50. I was told there was no unalloyed joy around the room. Should have happened two years ago. I think it was a significant announcement. Sort of trying to sink it in and work out whether it was or not. I and mean, I think what she's saying is she's pivoted. She's saying I'm going to reach across the House, recognise I don't have a majority. There cannot be a Conservative DUP only solution to this. We're going to talk to the opposition. I must admit, this is not the outcome I'd hoped for. I don't think it's the right outcome for the country. It feels to me like Groundhog Day. We spent over two years trying to get agreement, and it's not as if the opposition have been excluded. So why do we think that suddenly, if we ask for an extension to the 22nd of May, we're going to get agreement? I mean, this all sounds, to me, very strange. So I can only assume she's going to do something really radical. And clearly, from the options that were paraded uh, in Westminster, the one that came out on the top was Customs Union and this will be explosive for the party as a whole and for the country because they will see red. Labour says the talks must be genuine. She should have done this a long time ago. Um, my initial thought was she's been locked in a room with the cabinet all day and she's come out with a plan to talk to Jeremy Corbyn. If she's genuine about wanting a dialogue that um, it's, it's, a, it's an equal meeting, it's a meeting on equal terms and hopefully, finally, she will start to listen to what we're saying. I mean, I do, I do, I do hope she isn't trying to set a trap, that's all I will say. Um, I hope she's not trying to set a trap and, I mean, it's, it's, she's done it so often in the chamber, she's done it so often and said, well, you know, Labour haven't come up with anything, but the fact is, her government has been doing the negotiations. A rare gesture today in the notoriously tribal politics of Westminster. But this is a Prime Minister with little history of forming relations across the aisle. Well, Nick, what is here now? Extraordinary uh, marathon cabinet deprived of their phones. It must have been very difficult for them. Uh, what was the atmosphere actually like? What are your contacts telling you? Well, this was a very difficult cabinet with real division, divisions on extending Article 50. And tonight we have uproar in the Conservative Party and in the Democratic Unionist Party. Boris Johnson speaking for many members of the cabinet when he says it's disappointing that the cabinet is entrusting the final handling of Brexit to Jeremy Corbyn and the DUP again speaking many members of the cabinet saying subcontracting Brexit to the man that the Conservatives have demonised is unlikely to end happily. Now there were divisions between leavers and nouveau leavers such as Jeremy Hunt and Remainers. Um, those sort of ten Remainers, they were happy they could live with a long extension to Article 50. The 14 leavers absolutely not happy with that at all, not even happy with the modest extension proposed by Theresa May. But they are OK, they can live with an extension up to the 22nd of May, but no deal after that has to be the default, is their view. Now, for the Labour Party, Obviously an opportunity, but also risks. 
Yes. Now, uh, Jeremy Corbyn is welcoming these talks. He says they're a serious offer. He said the last talks with Theresa May were a serious offer, but he points out that, of course, she didn't change her mind at all in those talks. So his instinct is that he's probably not going to reach agreement with her, and so you'll go to stage two of what I was talking about in my film, which the Parliament will have a vote on her plan and a vote on his plan. He believes that his plan does actually deal with the Northern Ireland backstop because it talks about a customs union with the UK broad. having a say. It talks about close alignment on the single market and then it talks about full dynamic alignment on things like workers and environmental rights. And he's saying, look, the Prime Minister says that we need to compromise. Haven't had much compromise from her, but he says, I've been compromising this week because I was whipping my MPs to vote with things that I perhaps didn't feel particularly comfortable about. Fascinating. Thanks, Nick. Uh, earlier, I spoke to Michael Gove, who, as Environment Secretary, was in that long Cabinet meeting today. I began by asking whether Mrs May's ministers had actually collectively voted for her new approach. The Cabinet had seven hours of discussion, and one of the things that we are all committed to doing is making sure that we deliver Brexit. And the Prime Minister has tried incredibly hard to secure support for her withdrawal agreement, which would allow us to leave the European Union in good order. Sadly, it did not command a majority last Friday, and now we have to do everything possible in order to concentrate minds in Parliament so that people will vote to allow us to leave in good order and in a timely way. But did the Cabinet sign off on what she said? We had a very good discussion in the Cabinet about the vital importance of making sure that we leave the European Union at the earliest possible point. And the Prime Minister, as ever, That's summed no, up... Then. No, the Prime Minister summed up the conclusion of the Cabinet and the, uh, the view of the Cabinet collectively was that it was vitally important that any extension um, is as short as possible so that we can leave and avoid the European elections and make sure that we honour the Brexit referendum mandate. I'm just wondering, because a lot of people who voted for Brexit will be saying tonight, why didn't they resign? What, what, why did they allow her to do this? To, well, I, I, to effectively I, hand over the fate of Brexit to Jeremy Corbyn. No, it's not handing over the fate of Brexit to Jeremy Corbyn. We'll have talks, of course, with the leader of the opposition. But what we're really doing is making sure that concentrated minds in Parliament have a chance to focus on the, the options in front of us. Um, I campaigned to leave the European Union. I want us to leave the European Union at the earliest possible point. And the way to do that is to ensure that uh, everyone has a, an opportunity to reflect on the manifestos on which they stood. And those manifestos, both Labour and Conservative, committed both parties to ensuring that we honoured that referendum result. Now, Boris Johnson, who was shoulder to shoulder with you in that campaign, concluded tonight that the government policy is any deal is better than a bad deal. That seems to have been your guiding philosophy for some time in this. Well, I want to make sure that we leave. You've and gone along with each, stepping back on... Well, I think the critical thing is that uh, once we leave the European Union, once we're out, then we can chart our own destiny. And that's the single most important thing. And of but course, the EU will hold us to the deal. You can't suddenly start changing it once, well, once well, the UK's left. Uh, w one thing that we can do is ensure that we leave in an orderly and timely way. Uh, if we secure support for a withdrawal agreement, then we will have left the European Union. Um, Nick Bowles, former colleague, has described this as the worst cabinet in history, probably. Um, well, I, uh, Nick is an old, old friend, and uh, he made a decision last night which I very much regret. Um, I disagree with him about a number of things, and that's one of them. Well, he also but, said, but no I... one in Cabinet now or since 2017 has earned the right to lead the country. That'll be you, presumably, he's talking about. Uh, well, I shan't take it personally. Um, look, you're, you're effectively handing over the destiny of Brexit to Corbyn. That's what a no. lot of people in Westminster are saying tonight. No. You, you've got yourself no. into this mess, and now you expect him to get you collectively out of it? No, what we need to do is to recognise that there's been no majority in the House of Commons yet for um, a means of leaving the European Union, even though an overwhelming majority of MPs were elected on manifestos that committed them to leaving. So we need to concentrate minds. And of course, in talking to the Leader of the Opposition, uh, we have an opportunity to uh, uh, make sure that he honours page 24 of his manifesto and that we leave. And of course, of all of the options that we've had so far, the one that has commanded the largest support, though not yet a majority, is the Prime Minister's withdrawal agreement. 
Last December, from the dispatch box, you really laid in to Jeremy Corbyn. You criticised his response to the Salisbury attack. You said he'd been silent while fascists were, were running amok in Syria. And then you added, how can we possibly expect him to stand up for us in European negotiations? Quite. But this man's view of Brexit will now inform the government's next steps. Well, we need to secure a majority in the House of Commons. That is the, uh, the straightforward fact. And of course, we need to ensure that we um, uh, confront um, uh, and uh, deal with uh, the, uh, the consequences of the House of Commons not yet having secured a majority. Look, I'm uh, absolutely uh, convinced that Jeremy Corbyn would be a disaster as Prime Minister of this country. But I also think that it's really important that we make sure that everyone in the House of Commons has a chance to reflect on the options and make sure that we can leave the European Union. And you're giving up on the DUP and, and the wilder fringes of the Conservative Party now, are you? Uh, well, I dispute the use of uh, uh, phrases like wilder fringes. I'm not giving up on anyone. I think it's important that we all, as the Prime Minister said, uh, reflect on the need as a nation to come together and to honour the referendum result. And my own view is that the Democratic Unionist Party, our confidence and supply partners, are people whose um, uh, future role in making sure that we leave the European Union as one united kingdom is critical. There's no point inviting Corbyn in, and I'm sure you'd accept this, unless you're going to move. Unless some red lines are going to get smudged let's, and dissolved. Let's, Customs union, closer relationship with the single market. Are you ready for that sort of stuff? Let's see what happens in those conversations. And let's not preempt. The Prime Minister has been clear that she's inviting the leader of the opposition in, wants to talk, um, but also that what we need to do is to get, if at all possible, an agreed position. And that means that the Prime Minister will consider uh, in, those, uh, in those talks how we can ensure that we get the best means possible of leaving. My own preference has always been clear. I argue that we should leave the single market and also the customs union. It's now for everyone in Parliament to reflect on how we can make sure that we can leave the European Union at the earliest possible date. You've got a complex political negotiation now to enter with the Labour Party, then possibly to put through uh, more votes in, in the Commons to find a preferred way through, whether it'll command a majority. And you've got a week to do it. Yes. And you've basically got a week well, we, until the UK falls out. I mean, this is far too late, isn't it, to be doing this? Uh, well, ideally, you're right. We would have secured um, an agreement before now to leave the European Union on March the 29th. That was always my hope. That's how I've consistently voted in the House of Commons. But without a majority in the House of Commons, then we haven't been able to secure our departure. Um, and the Prime Minister is seeking now to ensure that everyone recognises that we all have to live up to our responsibilities to honour that referendum mandate. But even in January, people in Brussels were saying to us as journalists, the way ahead is to engage the Labour Party and shift on the red lines. It's been obvious for months that's been the way to go. And this Prime Minister has declined to do so until there are literally days left on the clock. Well, actually, the Labour Party has been engaged and it is important that we talk to colleagues um, uh, across the House of Commons in order to ensure that we live up to our responsibilities. And, of course, it's critical that we all recognise that uh, we have a democratic duty to come together and to ensure that we leave the European Union and we honour the mandate. Last question. For those people tonight, and there are quite a lot of them, as you know, in your party who are saying Brexit's been betrayed, uh, we're going to accept an unacceptable degree of influence, whether it's by entering into a customs union, you say it's too early to, to nail down that sort of detail. What's your message to them? Why have you gone along with this? Because I want us to leave the European Union. I want to make sure that we, uh, as a House of Commons, vote to leave the EU. One of my concerns has been that uh, there are people within uh, the uh, uh, House of Commons who want to frustrate that referendum mandate. There are people who want to uh, do everything possible to prevent us leaving. I want to ensure that minds are concentrated so that we do leave. That's the critical thing. Thank you very much. Well, uh, Jeremy Corbyn responded to the Prime Minister's offer of talks tonight by saying he was very happy to meet. So could they result in a way forward? In a minute, we'll be talking to the SNP, along with backbenchers from both the Tories and Labour, and indeed to Barry Gardner, Shadow Secretary of State for International Trade, who's joining us from Westminster. Welcome, all of you. Before we dive into that, let's just... Uh, to underscore the importance of this moment, look at the way that the papers are writing this up tomorrow morning. And, and uh, I don't think they can be accused of under, underplaying its importance. The Daily Mirror, help me, Jeremy, Brexit sensation. The Daily Mail, 
Theresa's last stand. The Guardian made calls for talks with Corbyn in a bid to save Brexit. And the Daily Telegraph, Cabinet backs no deal Brexit. This is talking about the discussion that went on about the extension or not in there today. But May turns to Corbyn instead. Well, let's start with Barry Gardner. Um, presumably, for you and your leader, this is welcome news and shows that your strategy has paid off. Look, I, I certainly welcome the fact that the Prime Minister has, albeit belatedly, uh, decided that she wants to uh, approach uh, the leader of the opposition and genuinely I think I and I do think she is genuine this time wants to bring uh, a different view on board I, I hope it betokens a willingness on her side uh, to ameliorate her what her red lines and and I think that is a sign that she realizes that her primary responsibility is to the country and not to her party and and we will certainly enter into any discussions in that spirit. If we you... want an end to this nonsense that has gone on for so long. So and business say, needs to when have... When you say her sorry, primary... I can't... Sorry to interrupt. Uh, I yeah. just wanted... Because that's an important point you've just made. It, it, when you say her primary responsibility is to the country, you, you trust her in that, do you? You believe this isn't just an attempt to, to keep the party politics going a bit longer? Look, <laughs> I, I want to trust her. Um, I do believe that on previous occasions um, there has been a hollowness to the way in which she pretended to reach out, which was shown by the fact that she refused to change her red lines. There was no attempt to take on board any other view than her own. But, but I want to focus on the way forward now and, and I do believe that we should welcome this initiative, we should take it at face value and we should do the best that we can now for the country to try and get uh, a deal that honours the referendum result and, and, and does the best for our economy that we possibly can, creates the security that we need in jobs uh, and also in environmental standards and protections. So the security of our country is absolutely vitally important and of course that is also at stake here when you look at uh, the European arrest warrant that would fall in right. the event of a no deal. Mm -hmm. uh, I was going to ask you what, what's top of your wish list but I think you've just pretty much <laughs> sketched out uh, the, the issues that matter most to you as a party. Um, assuming there's some sort of progress, you're then going to have to adopt and endorse a withdrawal agreement, the divorce agreement, which not so long ago you voted against. And it will be the same agreement because the Prime Minister has said it can't really be changed at this point. Mm. Yes, but you, you will recall that uh, my colleague Keir Starmer in the chamber, when, when that question was put to him, he said, look, um, it was the Prime Minister herself who earlier in the year said that these two were indivisible, the withdrawal agreement and the future political framework. Uh, and the objection that we have to dividing them, of course, is, is that uh, if you take them separately, um, you are committed to what you have done in the withdrawal agreement. But unfortunately, the 26-page document that is the future political framework does not contain that same level of binding assurances. And so it is a blind Brexit but now well, it would have appeared that it is a blind Brexit in, in which yeah, the person who is leading the country uh, would actually be unknown because Theresa May herself has said that uh, she might be standing down. So, so this is the, the key objection that we had to sundering those two. What we're talking about now is establishing, uh, I hope, a way forward through uh, looking again at the future political framework. But we would need to see some very solid assurances there uh, that mean that we can trust that what we embed okay. in that agreement is actually delivered upon. Could you see yourself signing off on an agreement? You seem now to accept the withdrawal agreement, but more widely, if it didn't guarantee the UK staying in a customs union? Look, uh, what I think we must do this evening is not to lay down additional red lines what we have said and what the Leader of the Opposition has made very clear to Theresa May is that we will conduct our side of these negotiations on principles, but not, not saying this yes. is a red line, no, no, you've got to years. agree with no, us. No, no, but for years you have set these six tests, we've heard about them many, many times, and that was one of them. So I, I guess we're saying 
that you're shifting red lines as well, mm. just as the Prime Minister has? Look, I, I think if you look over what happened last week um, in the indicative votes, there were eight options given to Parliament in, in those indicative votes. On average, most Labour MPs took that indicative vote process at face value. We said, look, we could live with, and on average, we, we voted in favour of four or five of those, uh, and, and there were lots of abstentions as well. But if you look at what happened on the Conservative side, uh, they voted on average for six and seven against. They were against six or seven. There were one or two that they, that they were prepared to, to go along with. Got We've it. been very open in saying that we want to compromise here. We will look at other options. And, of course, don't forget that actually the leader of the opposition whipped the Labour Party to vote for a multiplicity of options, which Barry weren't Gardner. originally in line with our, our, our five, uh, five principles. Thank you for explaining that. Um, well, here with us in the studio, Ian Blackford, the SNP's Westminster leader, along with Labour MP Angela Eagle and the Tory Brexiteer John Barron. Welcome. Ian Blackford, if we could start with the SNP and your view of these events, quite dramatic. Do you see this as a, as a real turning point or is it another false dawn? In, in I mean, it's another false dawn. And you know, Mark, one of the issues here, when we talk about Parliament in London, there's a devolved parliament in Edinburgh and Cardiff and there's supposed to be one in Belfast. And there's been utter disrespect shown to the devolved institutions. We're not invited into these talks at all. And it's absolutely disgraceful that we have sought to compromise over the course of the last near three year period. The Scottish Government has published document after document. We have our compromise position of single market customs union. It was in Scotland's place in Europe. And at no time has the UK Government engaged with us. And when you look at the facts that last night, that overwhelmingly Scottish MPs voted to revoke Article 50, we voted to have a people's vote, we are enshrining the principle of the votes of the people of Scotland that voted overwhelmingly to remain. And what's become increasingly clear, our voices don't count in Westminster. It's a very clear message which has been delivered. Well, it's about assemb assembling a workable majority, isn't it, for any proposition uh, still, as we saw yesterday. Is it doable, do you think? It's, it's literally days until the uh, well, EU say they <coughs> have to, to know what our concrete proposal is if they're going to grant another extension. Sure, and we're still engaged in a process because we've got a bill coming before Parliament tomorrow which would give us an extension, and we have indicative votes that are coming back on Monday. Now, we missed a major opportunity last night, and I have to say, if Labour had whipped their MPs effectively, and if the Labour MPs that had abstained had voted for the people's vote, then we would have got that through. If the Labour MPs that had abstained on revoke had voted for that, then we would have got that through. And well, I think there's a sense... You could have backed the customs, the, well, the Ken Clark option we, as well. We, we backed the single market and uh, uh, the customs yeah, union. But, that's important, but, but, because that's about, yes, but you, it's about, it's but about yes, the service if, if industry. If reaching a deal about, was the most important thing, you could have swung well, out, but, yeah, but we have we have compromised. But the point I was going to make is that there's a real in sense in sense, Parliament sorry, today. You compromise? Well, because we voted for the single market customs union. That's not our primary position. We don't want to leave the European At Union. All. We've made that clear. I know, but, but but I think what you've seen today in Parliament is MPs are trying to come together. We may get to a compromise position on Monday, and I think we've got to get to the end of that process. Now, when the European Council meets. I think what the European Council will be looking at is the signal that comes from Parliament. If Parliament can coalesce around something, then the European Council would grant us a longer extension. Now, quite frankly, given where we've been over the last few months, an extension to the 22nd of May simply isn't good enough. We need to take time to make sure we can take risk off the table, particularly the risk of no deal, which if, is a very real threat to the economy. If, as you uh, posit, uh, there could be something coming more clearly into focus on Monday, do you at that point go with it in the national interest or do you regard it in the Scottish national interest as being to your advantage not to uh, so that you can say later, no, mm. we didn't lend our support to this? No, I mean, we, I'm very clear about what we see as our priorities, but we are willing to compromise because we want to compromise in the interest of jobs and all our communities. And if there's a way we can keep the UK in the single market and the customs union, then of course we would do that. That is the, that is the least worst option, if I can put it that way. I don't want us to threaten jobs. And that's exactly what Brexit does. Every formulation of Brexit is going to make us poorer. If we can stay in the single market, stay in the customs union, have free movement of people, which is absolutely key for us if we're to drive our economy, then of course we'll look at those options. Ian Blackford, thank you so much. Um, John Barron, can you give us some sense of how this was received among your colleagues in the Conservative Party? 
Well, not very well for, for a lot of us, because for those of us who have campaigned uh, for Brexit and see it as an, an opportunity to be seized rather than a problem to be solved, um, we've been hearing from our own Prime Minister for the best part of two years now that she's going to honour the triggering of Article 50. We'd be leaving with or without a deal by the 29th of March, and then when she went for that extension and we opposed that, she got the extension, um, as we know. But we should be now in, that, in the position of giving certainty to people, um, and that is, if we cannot agree her, with her deal, then we should be leaving on no deal WTO terms on the 10th of April. And I think this pivoting now to the Labour Party um, is, is, is worrying because we must acknowledge that Parliament is a remain dominated, various shades of remain dominated. And if well, not Jeremy you, Corbyn. Well, well, we'll see about that. But if you compromise too much, you could be detaching yourself from the actual what people wanted when they voted to leave the EU, which is to leave the customs union, leave the single market, leave, well, you know, ECJ and the rest of it, control of our borders, money, etc., and laws. But and that's your, com that's and your interpretation yes. of what, but, of what well, Brexit Well, that, that was promised in both manifestos, well, actually. Well, that's your interpretation. Well, do, do you, both manifestos it, it wasn't it. played out in the referendum itself. Do you take satisfaction that Jeremy Corbyn is now apparently the kingmaker in this well, it situation? It is finally, after two years of trying to appease the extreme Brexiteers in her own party, the Prime Minister has very, very, very belatedly at the last minute decided that she has to reach out. And that's a good thing, as Barry Gardner has said, and Jeremy Corbyn has said that he will approach those talks in a spirit of compromise. But let's see what's happened here. She's got a cabinet that's riven straight down the middle, that is virtually incapable of governing. And she has reached out in desperation. It's not clear to me from listening to what she said tonight that she isn't still just setting a trap for us to leave on the 22nd of May. She absolutely said that's what she well, wanted to do. And then blame Labour. Yeah, she had, she, uh, we've just heard from Michael Gove, who virtually said the same thing. And if there's going to be compromise, uh, I think having messed up uh, these negotiations for the last two years and got herself into a complete hole, it's probably the case that we need a longer extension so we can start again and do this properly. She should have made this offer two years ago when she crossed the threshold of Downing Street and instead she's wasted all of that time and the Conservative Party now, particularly the extreme members of uh, the Brexit brigade who've driven uh, this, are now openly talking about having a no-deal EU crash-out, which will be catastrophic um, for my region and the constituents well, that I represent. Do you see, I mean, uh, Angela Eagle referring there to the strains, obviously, um, if it moves towards customs mm. union, mm. could we expect to see Liam Fox uh, depart from Cabinet? And more generally, do you see some of your colleagues, Steve Baker, people like that, as there being a serious danger of their resigning the Conservative whip now at this point. Well, I think, I think you'd have to ask them. By the way, I don't believe uh, that, you know, because you believe that WTO could work, although I would prefer a deal to no deal, I, I, I still, you know, think that if we cannot agree a deal, then what the Article 50 said when we triggered it is that deal or no deal, we would leave um, on, on the, what is now the, the 12th of April. How people position themselves going forward now is going to be interesting. Our chief concern is this for many of us, and that is we promised um, and to honour the referendum result. We triggered Article 50 in our election manifesto, certainly in the Conservative one. But you one, triggered Article it, 50 but, without it, a plan and then called a general election but, in your own interest and wasted in all both that time. manifestos, to my knowledge, we promised to leave the customs union, to leave the single market, Move well, away from the east. Well, lots of things. You didn't yeah, in the win a majority but, but in the, point, the election. The point I'm could could suggesting you now: vote, could you vote for a customs union? Yes. No is the short answer because it would be it would renege on a manifesto commitment. It would mean that we would, would be that mean a leaving rule the taker? Conservative Party for you. Uh, not for me, no. Um, but at the end of the day, we still can fight our corner in trying to get the prime minister to listen. The, the EU could write the textbook on 11th hour deals. No, no, and, I mean, and, and, and to, what to we be should honest, be trying to, if I just may finish, then I will let well. you go. What we should be trying to do is go back to the EU and say, look, if you don't actually allow us to sort out this backstop, this indefinite nature of the backstop, we will be leaving on no deal WTO terms. They're not going to reopen. Well, they do, they they're have not, written I mean, the textbook on 11th hour deals. And the Prime Minister deals. said it 
this is today. this is this is a myth Final that has word, sustained Andrew. the the Brexiteers, and what they're doing is playing Russian roulette with our economy. So let's get the grown-ups to come in and see if they can do a deal. But if we can't do a deal in the time that's left, let's have a longer extension and go back to the drawing board and get this right. Can I just add Andrew, one quick point? I'm one sorry. quick point. W we had lots of predictions of doom and gloom in 2016. If we voted to leave, they never transpired. We've had good economic well, prosperity we, we'll, since. Yes, so be wary can, of those who predict doom and gloom. They were wrong then and they will be wrong now if we were to leave on WTO. I'm first. not Tom prepared Bowen, to I'm gamble sorry. with my constituents' jobs like John is. We're not gambling.